Good morning. Good morning. Well, you know how rumors spread fast. Well, I discovered that rumors spread fast among eagles, too. Our neighbor spread uh, manure out there, and I went by on Tuesday, and there's 52 eagles. And probably four times that many crows. And then I went by the next day, and we're down to seven. So, uh, you know, the word got around, and they got what they wanted, and they left. And they all came back together. So, all right, well, I'm going to ask Pat to come up and share with you this morning a minute. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Good morning. All right. So, you know, when we're sitting here in church and, and uh, you know, we're going through the service and we try to show up every Sunday and everything else, and, you know, we have the collection and we have the envelopes and, and you know, we have special funds that we do, deal with every month or whatever. Um, you probably already have seen this, but this uh, letter talking about our fund of the, of the month of December, the carrying closet. When uh, we received this letter, it kind of made an impact on me. So I just wanted to show what kind of impact that we have when we do our giving and we have our <laughs> special funds. So anyway, Merry Christmas. It is hard to put into words what your donation means to the kids in middle school. The carrying closet is stocked and backpacks are being filled. The food and personal hygiene products will help ensure our kids have a safe, and healthy Christmas break. This wouldn't have happened without your generosity. What a beautiful lesson the kids will learn about kindness and sharing. If only you could see the smiles, the tears, and the relief on the faces of those who just want to be a kid and not worry about where the next meal will come from. You are making this possible. So you all deserve a, a big pat on the back, but it just shows <coughs> that you know, the missions that we have and the, and the giving that we do and those kind of things, it really does make an impact, you know. And, and we think we don't think really about the other end of things, but when the person took the time to write us this letter to let us know how much of an impact we made, you should all be proud of that. So, anyway, thank you very much. And then the last thing is, is uh, we have our annual meeting coming up in February, and we are still looking for a couple of people for volunteers for roles. We're uh, still looking for one more person to be on church council, and we're also looking for spots on the trust, the trust fund, and the nominating committee for next year. We need one more on the nominating committee. So please think about it. Um, if you're at all thinking about it and you want some information, don't be afraid to contact me or any of the members of the church council. But um, you know, uh, like Bill had said so ably the other or a couple Sundays ago or last Sunday. Um, the church council, you know, we've had years where things have been really rough, but we've been fortunate the last few years where uh, things are really going nicely. So anyway, now if you're ever interested in taking a chance and being on council, now is the time to do this. So anyway, <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pat. Well, the biblical image for that is bread upon the water. You don't know where it's going to go. You don't know what your activities, what you say, what you do, you don't know where it's going to go. So let us uh, rise as we begin our worship this morning. We join together in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who makes all things new, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Amen. Trusting in God's mercy, let us confess our sin after silence. Holy One, source of our renewal, we confess that we are wrapped up in sin and cannot free ourselves. We have not practiced your righteousness. Our hearts have turned away from you. For the sake of the world, you keep us alive. Forgive us that we may be reconciled to one another for the glory of your holy name. 
Amen. Thus says our God, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. God's mercy makes us new. We are forgiven in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen. <clears throat> so our responsive reading this morning is our call for worship. Psalm 40 is we read in our name. I wanted, I waited patiently upon the Lord, who stopped, who stooped to me, and heard my cry. The Lord left me in the hour of the desolate head, out of the mighty clay, and set my feet upon a high cliff, making my footing sure. The Lord put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many shall see and stand in awe, and put their trust in the Lord. And we are able to trust in the Lord. You may not turn to enemies or to those who are wise. Great are the wonders you have done, O Lord, my God, in your paths for us, in your plans for us. None can be compared with you. Oh, that I could make them known and tell them that they are more than I can count. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire. You have opened up my ears, burned my offering, and sin offering. You have not required. And so I said, Here I am, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I love to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is deep within me. I proclaim righteousness in the great assembly. I have not restrained my lips, O oh Lord, you know. I have not hidden your righteousness in my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your deliverance. I have not concealed your steadfast love and truth from the great assembly. You are the Lord. Do not withhold your compassion from me. May your steadfast love and your truth continually keep me safe. You may be seated as we turn to the Lord.
Holy God, our strength and our Redeemer, by your Spirit hold us forever, that through your grace we may worship you and faithfully serve you, follow you, and joyfully find you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. So we turn now to our readings for the day. And the honor of having the bells. And if you didn't notice, I was early. (laughs) Here, the servant identified as Israel speaks for herself and describes her honored mission, called before her birth like Jeremiah and John the Baptist. The servant is not only to restore Israel. The servant's ultimate assignment is to bring news of God's victory to the ends of the earth. God in faithfulness has chosen Israel for this task. First reading comes from Isaiah chapter 49, verses 1 through 7. Listen to me, O coastlands. Pay attention, you peoples from far away. The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing in vanity. Yet surely my cause is with the Lord, and my reward with reward with my God. And now the Lord says, Who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him? For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God has become my strength, he says. It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and His Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nations, the slave of rulers. Kings shall see and stand up, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves, because of the Lord who is faithful. The Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. Word of God, Word of Life. Thanks be to God. So now we'll hear the bell choir.
The second reading, I'm going to back up. Though God's church in Corinth is a fractious congregation beset with many conflicts, Paul opens this letter by spotlighting the multiple ways God has enriched and sustained its life as part of the divine call into the fellowship of our Lord Jesus Christ. The second reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Okay, time for kids. So, what do I have here? A lamb. That's what I'm after. A big sheep. A lamb. When you think of a lamb, what do you think of? What? White? Oh. Jesus, you're ahead of the game here. <laughs> so what do you think about just a lamb, like in our farm? What do you think about it? White? White? What? Curly? On the farm? On the farm? Okay. okay. <laughs> What else? What do they look like? Ugly? Huh? Cute? Huh? Cute? Okay. If they, uh, can they get along on their own? Not, not to start with they can't. They're dependent upon their mother, just like you. Just like us. And we're depending upon our mother and parents and so forth. They get along. Okay, well. Yes, what? On the other side of this lamb, this is what you said. Okay? Lamb of God. When we talk about the Lamb of God, who are we talking about? Jesus. Okay. So we need to think about those things that Jesus is gentle. You know, we'll say he's cute. Okay? Huh? He's gentle. He's, he's uh, well, in some ways, uh, when he goes to the cross, he's sort of helpless at that point. He's kind of surrenders over like a lamb. But he most of all is, is that he is going to be killed. Just like a lamb eventually is slaughtered, we say. And so he is like a lamb that goes to the slaughter. Someone that's going to be used for another purpose. And Jesus' purpose is to help us to be right with God. Okay? So Jesus becomes the lamb of God for us. And that's the uh, Often said several times in the Bible. Good. All right. Thanks. Thanks for coming up. Oh like, no, man, I got to get around my skirt and all that stuff. I can't let it get up. Okay. An older man. All right. Let's rise for the gospel. Acclamation. <laughs> Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God, who 
who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. And then Jesus turned and saw them following, and he said to them, What are you looking for? And they said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and see. And they came, and they saw where he was staying. And they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. And one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, today is a Sunday in Epiphany. These Sundays will be now until Ash Wednesday and into the Lent season. And so Epiphany is really about showing Jesus. How do we show Jesus in life? How is Jesus shown to us? so that we can understand who he is. And so that showing is really important. And now over the next uh, few weeks, you'll be showed by other preachers. And they will give you their perspective on what it means to see, to be shown the person of Jesus through the Epiphany season. And so it's interesting to see the different perspectives and even those different perspectives that now come to us in the Gospel this morning in John, in these particular perspectives. I suppose that Christmas time, probably the most, uh, one of the most at least, famous, is that of Handel's Messiah. Messiah, the coming of the Anointed One, the Chosen One. I'm sure if I say that word, if those of you who are familiar with it are thinking about what is happening. What is happening in this whole story is Handel writes this whole cantata all the way from Jesus' birth to the end. But the Messiah, Messiah, I think you're thinking in your mind, for those of us who may not be so musically inclined, but those of you who are, probably what's going through your mind is the hallelujah chorus. Because that's what sticks out most of all. And I think in that jubilant, in that particular way, in that wonderful way, it's really important for us to share with each other and to think about in our own life what this God means to us and how he is laid out before us. And today, in the Gospel lesson from John, on this Sunday in Rank of Epiphany, this is exactly what is happening. And so the first thing when John comes, he says, look, the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God. So what is John thinking and what does that all mean? When he puts this title or this name upon Jesus, what is the significance of this? Well, there may be several things. One of the things is is that when we talk about the Lamb of God, John and his fellow citizens, would be thinking back 1,500 years. Back to the time of Moses, back to the time of Egypt, 
back to the time when the plagues came to Egypt and they were to what? They were to slaughter the lamb <coughs> and they were to put the blood on their doorways. And the angel, death, the angel of death would pass over them on the tenth plague. And they would be spared from the destruction that was to take place. And so it comes on and it comes on farther yet because it, we are thinking about the Passover. Passover that the Jewish people celebrate every year. And when we think about the Passover, we think about what Jesus did and what happened in that time of Passover for him. What happened there? Well, I'm sure that John was also thinking about every morning, every night. One of the priests would go to the temple and slaughter a lamb for the sins of the people. Now that may sound to us somewhat gruesome and somewhat awful, but that was believed here is to give the forgiveness of God to the people. And so John in his mind has got to be thinking that the Lamb of God here, if he is going to be the Lamb of God, he is in a sense replacing or transforming all of those historical ways in which people were thinking that when that phrase, the Lamb of God, comes out, that this isn't the person of Jesus. It's all wrapped up in the person of Jesus. That Jesus is truly the Lamb of God. And then John talks about the Son of Man. The Son of Man. That may sound a little bit strange to us, but we've used it. You're acquainted with that, I think. The Son of Man or the Son of God. Did I say Son of Man? Son of God. <coughs> son of God, that Jesus was the Son of God. For us, we may think that that's kind of strange. It's kind of different. But you see, in the ancient world, and particularly in Jesus' time and before, the king, the Pharaoh, the Emperor, all those in those high positions are thinking and proclaiming themselves as the Son of God. But they are the Son of God. And that's why they've risen to such a place. That's why they are in where they are in the sense of rulership and unquestioned rulership amongst all the people. And so John was talking about the Son of God. But this really is the Son of God. All those that have gone before and all those that claim in his day to be that way are all imposters. That Jesus is the one in which God has set his sights. God has chosen this person of Jesus in the baptism that John performed last Sunday as we read about the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan. That here is really the Son of God. So you can see in some sense here we're talking about Jesus as we show Jesus and what he means and what the significance of that is. In a sense it's kind of uh, well, replacement therapy we would say. Jesus is replacing all of these things that have been traditions and things that people have believed and understood. That it all begins to come and to center in upon Jesus. And then as that gospel text moves on, they ask him about rabbi. He's a rabbi. That means he's a teacher. That means there are things to be gained and learned from him and to understand. And so they understand that Jesus is the one to whom we are to find the greatest of teachings. That here Jesus is one who is a real teacher. Teaching the truth. Teaching the way to live. Teaching, teaching the way of God to the world. And not simply making wise statements, but actually following the way and the will and the path of God himself. And you see, those disciples are, well, 
They would like to learn more about this. But somehow they've caught the bug here a little bit. And they want to know where he's staying. And well, he says, come and see. Come and ask those questions. Because he's wondering, what is it that they are curious about? What is it in their life that they are seeking? And I suppose for us, that's exactly the question we ought to be asking. What is it in life that we are seeking? And some of us are early on in life. Some of us are late in life. But that question is still a live one. What is it about life and how is it that we are to seek that? You see, Jesus is the one. He's the rabbi. He's the teacher. To whom we are to learn about what life is to be about. How life is to be invested and given. How servanthood is to come to the rise to the surface. How the gifts of the Spirit are to proclaim, be proclaimed through our actions and our words. How we are people of God. We are to go out into the world. We are to go out into the world. Because we've heard the teachings of Jesus. And it changes and shapes and determines our life. I think one of the most interesting things about this whole story is the person of Andrew. John the Baptist says that he is less. That Jesus is the primary one. Jesus was there before him. You see, that's the way it is with Andrew. Andrew, who is Simon's brother. Because Andrew is always reaching out, it seems, to others, bringing others to Jesus. He reaches out to Simon Peter and brings him to Jesus. Later on in the Gospels, he finds the boy with five loaves and two fish and brings them to him. He's out in the world amongst this Greek culture, and he's bringing the Greeks to Jesus. But the interesting thing about Andrew is, is that he's in a subordinate position. And we know that very clearly in the sense of Peter. We don't think a lot about Andrew. We think about Peter. But Andrew is always working behind the scenes. He's always sort of undercover. But he's always alert and aware. He's always reaching out. He's always doing something, apparently. And I think that's sort of the way it is with us. We're not going to be famous people. We're not going to write history books about us. We're not going to change the world in some grand and fantastic way. But we are to be like Andrew. We are people who work, in a sense, undercover. We are less than Jesus. And so but we still work out there. We do all these wonderful things, just one to one, day to day, time to time. It's no big deal. But when you add them all together, they are a big deal. When you add one's life together, it is a big deal. And how you've touched the lives of other people, how you've done and accomplished certain things, how you've been involved in certain things, all these things seem to be secondary. But they really are not. They are primary. Because they are the work of God in the person of Jesus Christ through you and me. But we are really understanding that who Jesus is. That he is the Lamb of God. That he is the Son of God. That he is the great teacher to whom we are to come and to learn. But in the end, they're all looking for the Messiah. The one who will bring all of this together. The one who will sum it all up. The one who will really gain, you might say, the victory in the end. And so, when Jesus is called the Messiah, 
This is sort of an encapsulation of all of these concepts, of all the understandings of people. And it all resides in one simple way, in the person of Jesus. That he is the anointed one. Because we anoint kings and queens. They did back then and we still do now. The chosen one, the chosen one of God. That was That is the view. That is the understanding. And in understanding that, God has chosen Jesus. And as John the Baptist realizes, there in the baptism, God has chosen Jesus to this special call. And so is Messiah. It's a hallelujah. It's the Messiah that God brings to us. It's the anointed one, the chosen one. And we say it all the time. But we say it not in the Hebrew, we say it in the Greek. Christ, Christos. And so every time you think about that, every time you say that word, Jesus Christ, it's not a name. It's more like a title. It's more like a call. It's a summing together of all of these concepts and all of these things that have gone centuries upon centuries before the time of Jesus and centuries upon centuries since Jesus, all wrapped up in one little neat package we call Jesus. That Jesus is the Messiah, the chosen one of God. And just as these disciples and just as Andrew and all the others, John the Baptist followed after Jesus and spread that word that did miraculous things through the whole world from these few individuals that were just plain, ordinary people like you and I. The world was changed and is being changed because we recognize that all things are wrapped up in the person of Jesus. He is the Messiah. And that's the Hallelujah Chorus. And so may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.
rise as we continue our worship together, as we confess our common faith in the Apostles' Creed, let us begin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended to heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, this morning, I want to welcome Todd back to worship this morning after his uh, knee surgery. And Bern Zingwide had surgery this week, and so, as you know, many of these uh, procedures, sometimes we think they're just... Uh, uh, what should I say, a cakewalk, but they aren't always. They're still something that's serious. And so we pray for those who have had surgery and will have surgery as well as we go forward. So let us, uh, let us pray. <clears throat> Dear Lord, as we come to you this morning, help us to be like Andrew. Help us to bring Christ and bring others to, to Christ. Help us to understand the summation of Jesus and all that he encompasses, all that he is to us and to the world, all that he is to the faith, all that he is as Messiah. And so we join with their unending praise and hallelujah. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, as we come to you today, we realize that many people go to the hospital and wonder what is going to happen. They're concerned and perplexed about certain things. And so we pray for those who've had successful surgery in their recovery. We pray for those who are to have surgery, to have the kind of medical treatment that is to help them to regain the health that they once had. And so, Lord, help for all of us who are healthy and feel like we are well, that we realize how good and how important it is to have our health, and that when we lose it, we realize how bad it is. And so, Lord, keep us mindful and to be healthy people, both in faith and in life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, as we come to you today, we also look around us and see that there are many things that are difficult in the world, things that are trying for us and for other people. And so we find that those folks that are suffering, those folks that are having difficulty in life, that they would come to realize that God is on their side and God comforts them through the person of Jesus Christ. And so help us. Help us to be a comforting hand for each other as we are instruments of Christ in the world. Lord, in your mercy. Yes, Lord. And in the struggles of life, we realize that many things are beyond our control. Many things are very difficult to accept. Many things are very difficult for us to realize and to understand. But help us to put our faith and our trust in your guidance, in your leadership, to give us new life and new breath each day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We have concerns for our community. We have concerns in our own life. We have concerns for the life of those that we are most attached to and most caring about. And so we take this moment to pray in silence for those concerns around us, and for those individuals that are especially near and dear to us. We especially remember in our congregation and hold up before you Elvin and Helen Bird, Kim Durbin, Ramona English, Todd Fetch, Janice Pink, Bob Janka, Janet Ruff, Lorraine Shepard, Carol Wheeling, the call committee in their diligent work, and the family of Rob Whitewine. All these we hold up before you and whatever else you see and others may need. We pray in the name of Jesus who comes to us today, every day, as your Lord, as our Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So 
The Lord be the peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Please share the peace with each other around you as you feel comfortable. Please rise as we continue our worship with our offering prayer as we pray it together. Let us begin. Liberating God, you break the bonds of injustice and let the oppressed go free. Receive these offerings in thanksgiving for all your works of merciful power and shape us as people of your justice and freedom. You give your hand and glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us join together and pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the land is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You will be seated. Please come. All is ready.
Please rise. May the body of our Lord Jesus Christ and his holy precious blood strengthen and preserve you in true faith and to eternal life. Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look with favor upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah, um, the hockey sticks are out there just waiting for hands. And there's uh, about 11 o'clock. We're going to come back in, have some wonderful stew thanks to the carnivals and some other treats so as you walk out you won't see the usual treats which we're offering this week but they'll be available at like 11 o'clock downstairs and we're hoping that if you uh, can't play outside or don't feel like you want to uh, there is some card games down below and also we need some spectators you know and some some referees so <laughs> All right. Closing in. The rise your light is down. 350, 340.